There we go. Okay, so we are in module 13 here. Welcome to module 13. We've wrapped up our chapter 7. Now we're on to chapter 8. <clears throat> we're going to cover chapter 8 in lightning style here, skipping over values from income statements as far as any questions are concerned. I'll briefly talk about them because they're a good organizing structure for the rest of the topics that are in chapter 8 that you do have questions on. And we'll also talk about capacity variances, which seem a little disjointed, but again, if if we put them in the right structure of how lean accounting tends to be done, then we, we can make sense of, of why they're included in this, this chapter. So we have basically uh, three different types of questions. Direct costing back flush questions, throughput accounting back flush questions, and the capacity I'm enjoying it. There we go. There we go. Thank you. Uh, capacity variance questions. So those those three, we're going to cover those three. And as I said, as an organizing principle, as an organizing principle, we'll cover values from income statements, which, which kind of help us put these into context. All right. So in the textbook, let's open it. Let's explicitly open a new, new tab. <clears throat> I have my Gene Sibelius joke. And then... The math. So, the point of this math is to point out uh, to kind of to kind of break us off of where we've been going ever since chapter one. The idea behind chapter one was is very simple: pi equals r minus c, r dot minus c dot, right? And there are supposed to be a variety of things that go into the dot. They're just supposed to, the dot is supposed to summarize. Oh, we got a bunch of variables that, that drive revenue, a bunch of variables that drive cost, and Lean accounting basically says, okay, well, from that, you could either go down the road of cost management, which is what chapter 2, 3, uh, 4, 5, 6, and 7 especially, 7 and, and, and 2 are, are kind of kind of really heavy into that, go down, the path that they go down, and, and say, well, let's, let's focus on these drivers of cost and try to minimize costs as a result because we have a lot of control over costs. Sure, we can, we can also have efforts to minimize, maximize revenue, but we're going we're gonna to probably disproportionately favor focusing on minimizing those costs, managing those costs. And lean accounting comes from a lean mindset, lean practitioners, and lean philosophy, et cetera, et cetera. Lean is the idea here, which makes this comment that says, well, yeah, okay, fine. Good for you. You can focus on these drivers of cost. But some of these drivers of cost also drive revenue. So if you'll notice, there's an X1 and an X2 and an X3 over here. And if we're just cost-minded, we could say, oh, well, we want to minimize if, assuming, assuming X1 has a positive relationship to cost, X2 has a positive relationship to, to cost, and X3 has a positive relationship to cost, meaning they all, the more X1, X2, X3 you get, the more cost you have, assuming they, they all drive costs up, then we want to minimize X1, X2, X3. Okay, if you have that mindset, great, but those might also have a positive association with revenue. So basically the idea is, if you follow cost accounting to its, you know, if you follow the, the strictest, mentality of cost accounting, which was is kind of in, embodied in chapter seven, was the standard standard costing principles where we're gonna get the general ledger to spit out these numbers that tell us how to how to get better variances time after time after time, you're gonna end up with a company that produces crap goods and treats its people like crap. You're gonna squeeze every piece of efficiency out of the direct labor you have, you're going to use the cheapest direct labor you can because you want the positive uh, favorable variances every 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 quarter for, for those two. You're going to use the cheapest goods you can and um, you're going to do the least quality work that you can and not try to rework or whatever, not not do any quality assurance. So that would increase your, your direct materials uh, quantity variance or make it more favorable that is. So that would all, those all would, would theoretically at least be drivers you could push over here to minimize your costs. But simultaneously, people don't pay as much for low-quality goods. So you're also driving down your revenue. So you're driving down your costs, at the same time you're driving down your revenue. What we're trying to do in the end, go way back, the whole reason we set this out is because, of course, we're a, a for-profit firm. And we're trying to maximize the profit that that we are returning for the investors through a voluntary exchange with consumers. Okay, driving both of these down, assuming it's at the same rate, that does nothing to profit. 
And very likely, you drive down costs. You, you might even drive down revenue even further. So you drive down costs a little, but you drive down revenue even further. So you're actually reducing the profits that you're getting. So the lean critique is there's some overlap here between drivers of cost and drivers of revenue. These are, these are the value stream. That's the terminology that, that you, could, you could basically use for X1, 2, and 3 in this little example. These are factors that affect cost and they affect revenue. These are parts of the thing. These are parts of your business that bring value to the customers. That's, they want this. And you can also have some auxiliary things that bring value to the customer that, that don't drive a lot of cost. Oh, great. Make sure we maximize these. We've got to focus on these. Those are good. And we got to make sure that when we're minimizing any cost in this, we, we do it in a smart way that doesn't disproportionately minimize the revenue we're going to get from it. So we have to do that probably over time through what, the, this is the term of art that they use, a process of continuous improvement. If there's something that overlaps, you want to deal with that and, and maxim, man, manage that cost through a process of continuous improvement, meaning you want to be very careful with it and try to look for decreases in that cost across a long time because it's going to take some care and some gentleness even with those costs uh, so that you can, you can get it so that it, you reduce costs without, without simultaneously reducing the revenue that comes from that. And then here, we, where Lean basically gets its name, is it says, if there are costs that don't overlap, they're just, or excuse me, there are factors that are driving just costs that don't overlap between costs and revenue, those are waste. They're like fat. You know, on, a, on, on your, your hamburger, you can get, the regular ground chuck, something like 80% meat to 20% fat, and that fat is good, tastes good, right? It's very savory. It's where the savory taste from in the hamburger comes from, or or whatever whatever um, whatever protein you're, you're talking about. But it's it's not contributing to the actual protein of of the protein that we're talking about, and so it's you you can then get a, a leaner cut of ground chuck in the supermarket, and it's always oh, 85%, it's 90% meat, only 10%. I mean, you can even get super lean, get 95% meat and only 5% fat. And then you've got to usually have to add something in to make it palatable. But regardless, the point is, is lean basically says, let's, let's go there. Let's focus your cost management on the actual waste to lean up your firm. So you're only incurring the cost you really need, and you're managing those in a process of, of continuous improvement. So there, there are three, three big, uh, well, well, let me make my, my caveat. I make it in the text here, but my point, uh, I make it some point in this, this first section, 8.1. The caveat here is uh, there's no, the whole class doesn't follow rules. Wow, that's, that's not quite right. It's kind of right. The gist of it is right. If you remember back in chapter one, we breezed through that very quickly, the very first section talks about prescriptivist versus descriptivist. And the way cost accounting or managerial accounting differs from your financial accounting class that you're in is financial accounting is dictated by the SEC, which runs the FASB, which runs GAAP, and they have these rules and the pronouncements and case history associated therewith that you have to follow or you go to jail. And that's exaggerating a little bit. You know, you, have, you, go to jail, you get fired, you get fined, you go to jail eventually if you, you go down that road. With managerial accounting, this is just the, the accounting that people do for businesses in nature, if there were nobody watching, they would still do this accounting because they want to maximize the profit. They want to get their company as far forward on their mission as possible. And chapter eight here, and so as a result, the idea is that a lot of things we talk about in this, this textbook, in this class, I can't point to, this is rule. This is why you have to do it this way. Usually I, I phrase it in terms of, well, companies usually find it most profitable to do the calculation this way. And so this is how we're going to do the calculation. It's kind of like I'm more of a biologist observing wild monkeys or wild animals. And that's the businessman or businesswoman we're talking about, I guess. But I'm, I'm observing them. And this is how, oh, this is how they generally do it. <clears throat> and, and this is, this is perhaps the epitome of that being the case. Lean is, is a, is a consultant's dream. They get to sell lots of consulting hours and, and hopefully I, I, on a lot of companies make a big difference in, in the company. So the company is happy and they give referrals to the consultant and so on and so forth. But it's not, it's not run, especially more so than any other part of the, the, the class here run by any sort of rulemaking body. So I had to cobble together these principles from a whole lot of consulting sources, a variety of textbooks that kind of touch on it here and there. And so I've come up with, I think are the, the, the key general techniques for how you do accounting in a lean firm. That's what we're talking about, lean accounting. It's accounting 
that you do, what changes to the accounting reporting will you do in a firm that uses the lean philosophy or is a lean is driven by lean practitioners? <clears throat> and so there are three. Okay, this is back where I before I got on my little detour. There are three basic ones we're talking about. One is we, we tend to change how we use income statements to make them what are called value stream income statements. And there are three things we do with that. <clears throat> We can get into that again as just an organizing principle in a second. The second thing is you change how you cost, how you do, you, you do the costs. So costing for reduced inventory and costing for time related waste is the third, waste is the third one. And those, those are where we get our three types of questions you're going to, to be asked is these, these latter two right here. Because backflush is a, is a, a timing and a form of, of how you account for inventory. Uh, so, uh, wait, uh, a set of rules about timing and and what counts as inventory that that we're going to have to learn if we're going if you're going to do lean accounting. And then the capacity variances are are related to time related waste, trying to minimize our time related waste. All right, so you let's go ahead and talk about value stream income statements real quick. So the idea is we have a value stream that produces value to the customers. It's what the sequence of activities requires to bring the customer for order to delivery, what you really care about as a customer from the moment you order till the moment the product is delivered. And, and even you can see thereafter, but let's just make this very simple and just say the sequence of activities required to bring the customer for order to delivery. And those are things you're bringing to the customer. There are a lot of other things companies tend to do, but the customer doesn't care about it. You don't go to, usually, I don't know, maybe, maybe you're different, but most customers don't go into a store and say, well, I want to buy that product. It really speaks to me. That's a great iPhone, but yeah. What, what exactly is your employee's 401k plan? I'm going to base my buying decision off of that, that factor. No, no, you usually don't do that. Sorry. It's not usually what you do as a consumer. There are things you care about. There are things you don't. Value stream is those things you care about that bring you from order to delivery or bring you from, from initial interest to eventual satisfaction and happy smiles because you got the product and you're happy with it. All right. I think this, maybe this is where I, one of the parts where I make my point about there's, this, this is all me distilling a general sense of what people do. <clears throat> Sometimes there are, are different ways of talking about value stream income statements. We call them plain language income statements or plain English income statements. The idea is that because we've done, we, we're going to organize the income statement differently here in a table format and with different rules, it becomes plainer and, and clearer for non-accountants to understand, like in plain English or in plain language. All right. So there are three, base, three general ideas of what you do. Uh, you don't use variance adjustments, so they, they, they're going to throw out everything we learn in Chapter 7. Uh, you only report actual costs, so every, every account is at actual. No, no carving out of, of variances as you do the journal entries. And you're going to separate out, in different columns usually, uh, your value stream costs versus your non-value stream costs. And sometimes you can subdivide non-value stream costs into, into like a medium waste and a full waste or different, you can use different terminology, but you can, you can kind of get these into at least two categories and maybe even to three categories, separate out value stream and then uh, non-value stream, but important and non-value stream and likely to be waste categories. And lastly, you do, you adjust for changes in raw materials and finished goods inventory at the end of the income statement to true it up to the rest of your financials. All right, so first of all, no variance adjustments. Again, we're going to race, race through these real quick. So this is how a traditional income statement will look if it's using full a full version of standard costing. Uh, it might it might roll these up into just general just just one line of adjustments, sure. But if you're if if the accountant is really trying to get the user of the income statement to to use the information from all the all the variances that we talked about, or most of the variances we didn't didn't put mix and yield in here, but a, a, a decent swath of various variances here, eight eight lines. The account is going to report all those. And here is the problem. We spent two weeks on this, and the majority of you are accounting majors, and the rest of you are gluttons for punishment because you're in an accounting class and you don't have to be. And within six months, a good portion of us will not remember very well what these numbers mean. And we studied it for a good two weeks of intensive work. What, what is, what is a person who's never studied any of these, these, these things going to make of this information? That's, I'm, I'm kind of channeling the lean accountant in me, the lean practitioner in me. Lean, lean practitioner will say, they, they can't make any sense of this. They're like, why are you adjusting things? What's wrong? What in the, what, uh, I, they're just going to say, I can't use this. 
So yeah, that's that's the argument of, of lean practitioners is that this is this is not useful to the non-accountant. And even and the accountants have difficulty explaining it to the non-accountant, even when the accountant knows very well what they're doing. So yeah, let me, let me rephrase it. I'm not gonna throw you under the bus in six months, you won't some of us won't know. Fine. In going forward, even if you have perfect, you retain, retain perfectly everything you know right now about chapter seven, you know, you're, you're at your peak knowledge because you've, you, we just wrapped up the quiz on Friday. Um, imagine the task of trying to, in six months, a year, two years, explain all that information to somebody who's never taken an accounting class or somebody who's never taken anything, uh, in depth about, about variance analysis. You're going to have a challenge there. So let me, let me rephrase it to be, to be more, more like that. <clears throat> all right. So instead, all the costs are recorded at actual. So this is right here. This is the orange. That's factor number one of value stream income statements. You record these costs at actual. These are actual materials costs, actual direct labor costs, actual indirect labor or support labor costs, actual machines cost, which is a type of overhead, right? And all the services probably a type of overhead. Facilities are probably a type of overhead. These are actuals, though, of each of these. And then any other category, we have actuals there. So the, the rows categorize the cost type, but it's the actual number that we've incurred during the period. Great, that's the first change we in the value stream income statement that lean practitioners smile upon. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, let's keep it at actual so everyone knows what we're actually doing. No, 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 we shouldn't have any conversations that say, well, actually that number's at full standard, so therefore it carves away all the variances that we accumulated up till then, because of the price and the quantity variance, and, and then everybody falls asleep. Second difference here is <clears throat> we're gonna separate it out into value stream costs. So you saw that, of course, you see this. You see this in the columns. And so here I've kind of made it into three different, different, um, columns, you know, three, three different categories of columns, even though there are five columns total. So we have our orange, which are our value stream costs. They're, they're directly related to value streams. People come to our business in this example for parts and for maintenance. And so costs we incur directly for, for serving the customers and their, their parts mission for when they come for parts and costs we incur directly to serve maintenance to the customers, those are those are recorded right here. Now we have this middle category. Uh, I have a name. I call them quasi value stream. I, I I lean on that quasi word, don't I? We have another category here, which is in blue, which I like quasi value stream. Okay, so the customer isn't actually coming today because of our product development and sales and marketing. At least the relationship's much less direct, but over time. This probably will drive a lot of their, their attendance to our value streams. So product development, for example, we're, we're spending a lot of time developing new products, new parts, new maintenance techniques, whatever it is in this example. We're, we're spending, that's, I cued on that because that's a really big number, 251, 600. And, and so we're, maybe this is kind of a medium. It's, it's almost a value stream. It's middle value stream, quasi value stream. And sales and marketing, you know, we're, we're building up our relationship with our customers. Also, probably useful over time. So we're going to put that in a separate category. This company, anyway, chose to practice lean accounting this way. So it had this right here. And then over here is red, which is considered a waste, support, or other. Now, I want to be real careful about the wording I use here. The idea is not that all these costs are justified, they can't be touched. And all these costs are waste. It's a, prior it's a level of scrutiny that we need to give it. It's... Over here in the waste categories, they are the most likely to have waste because they're so distant from the value stream. That's the argument that the lean says. So we're going to separate it out so that we can scrutinize very carefully these costs. These ones in the middle have a medium level of scrutiny we should apply because they have a medium likelihood of waste, of containing, containing waste because they are somewhat separated from the value stream. Customers aren't directly coming to us based on our product development today or directly coming us to us generally about our sales and marketing. It's probably a, a large campaign that's designed to build brand salience over, over quarters and years. So this might be more of a, a middle level thing. So we have a middle level of scrutiny we apply to it. And right here are, are our value stream costs and they could contain waste. Especially over time, we, we can improve that with a process of continuous improvement. There's that phrase again. And we just want to have make sure we're very careful and we generally are going to put a lower level of scrutiny on on or lower level of suspicion that these costs include waste because they are directly serving the customer. These are where we're bringing in the revenue. <clears throat> so this 150,000, I, I mean, 
It could be a lot of it ways, but it could be that like, Maybe five, we expect five, uh, likelihood of being about 5% of support being waste, about 2.5% of these quasi uh, value stream costs being waste, and maybe about 1% of the value stream costs being waste. In each case, the vast majority of them are not waste. But if we're going to focus our scrutiny, our cost management on something, well, this has the highest likelihood of those, those three levels. <clears throat> And the last difference is, is down here, but it'll be highlighted again here. Now come back to this, this note, because you're gonna, you're gonna notice this a little bit in the questions. The last thing is because of the way, because the value stream income statement reports on actual costs in the current period, uh, and some of the costs of the goods sold were incurred last period, um, we're gonna have some inventory adjustments we have to make. So to true up this, this actual cost, the total column right here, uh, the total value stream profit right here, and, and our, our net profit down here, some of that is due to us releasing debits from the balance sheet or retaining debits onto the balance sheet, basically. So we're going to put this inventory adjustment here to bridge this and this. And of course, we have corporate allocation. We can ignore that for now. But this bridges to that through this inventory adjustment. Again, if we ignore this, it would be a perfect match. This would be 1.5 million minus uh, 530,000 would give us just, just shy of 1 million on this number right here. It's only at 524,000 because of this extra corporate allocation. I included, I included that in there for realism, <clears throat> but it's not really unique to value stream income statements. The key is right here. We have our opening inventory value of of our all our inventory accounts and our closing inventory accounts. Oh, specifically, specifically, I think we're talking about our, our finished goods inventory, but it, might, but it might be all inventory, depending on how the lean company works it. And we have our closing inventory. Yeah, it's finished goods inventory. Um, and then the difference between those two is what our adjustment is going to be. So in this case, for example, we built up a lot of costs on our in our finished goods account from previous periods. That was our opening inventory. And we've sold off a lot. From, from the balance sheet, because we look, we reduced the, the value of the inventory by, by $530,000. So we're going to subtract away this profit, $530,000, because that's, that's cost of goods. That's, that's cost that were incurred last period that aren't reflected up here in these rows right here. And we are benefiting from those costs this period because we were winding down our inventory a little bit. So our net profit is right here. Okay. Uh, back up here, there are some similarities you're going to notice between our back flush cost calculations and process costing. But they are good similarities, not the bad ones. Uh, don't, don't, don't say, oh, prof, chapter six was, uh, professor made it out to be really bad, or oh, I know it was really bad, whatever. Um, remember we started chapter six and saying we really just have a an uh, very simple idea. We want to take the average overhead cost per unit. That's basically what we want. Uh, lean basically stop, stops right there and it's like, yeah, that's what we want. That don't, no, no complications required. No, that's it. It's largely what the lean, lean system does with a few little caveats here and there that are much less minor than we have in chapter six. All right. So now we get into where we're talking about, um, the, where we, where we set up the, the kinds of questions you're going to answer on, on the quiz for chapter six here. So lean, I'm, I'm organizing the philosophy as lean being this umbrella term and just in time and also throughput accounting and theory of constraints and I think there's one or two others um, being kind of subcategories of lean. And that could start arguments if you try to tell somebody else that. I, I've done it for convenience. I have one chapter to cover, you know, books upon books that people have written about this. So we're going to deal with it just like this. So the idea is lean, lean um, comes with the idea that we're trying to reduce all those X sixes and x sevens, all the waste up here in, in the cost function. We're going to focus our energy on that. And almost to a person, lean practitioners will say, well, holding extra inventory is waste, just period. Because like I don't come into the store and ask about the employee's 401k, I don't usually come in and ask, well, I'll only buy the iPhone if you also have 10,000 other ones in inventory. Have you ever done that? I see the iPhone. I want that one. But I only want it if you have like a million other in the warehouse. 
you don't care about their inventory stores. As long as they have one right there, you care about delivery to you, but you don't care about the stockpile of inventory out there. So it does not drive revenue. Not, not directly. That's what lean practitioner will say. It doesn't really or directly or significantly drive revenue, but it does incur a lot of costs. To build up a, a stockpile of inventory in the warehouse, you, you have the, the costs of, well, the warehouse, that's costly to maintain, to staff, to police, to give security. You know, there's iPhones. We're talking a million iPhones in a warehouse. That's, that's a target. You've got security you have to incur. You have insurance. All these costs that are associated just with storing it. Then there's the cost of obsolescence. Well, you have larger amounts of inventory. More of it is going to get just become obsolete with time as you or other competitors update the technology and, and produce new products that are more appealing to customers. <clears throat> uh, let's see what else on well, warehouse costs, um, obsolescence, tra oh, transportation as well. So yeah, if you, you might have more costs to transport things to and from the warehouse if you have this, this robust warehousing system. All right, so, so most lean firms adopt or move toward, as much as they can, a just-in-time model of production. So what I want to do is I want to produce products uh, as close to the time that an order is received, or at least that's the ideal, is only after an order is, is received, and do it very quickly, defect-free, with cell-based production. So the idea is to reduce it to as small a unit, as atomized a unit of workers as you can, or stations as you can, to get this one product through. Instead of taking a batch of 10,000 products to station A, then station, or department, department A, then department B, then department C, then department D, we take the processes of A, B, C, and D, we give like a station around one room and have a worker who's cross-trained on A and B, and a worker who's cross-trained on C and D do that very quickly for one product when it's ordered. That's, that's the basic idea here because we're saving ourselves all these costs up here and we, and the, the lean practitioner will say we're not losing a lot in terms of revenue when we, when we attack that kind of waste. What that means is when you adopt the just in time philosophy, we often, it goes hand in hand with this back flush costing as a simpler approach to tracking inventory costs. And that's where 65 to 75% of the questions on the quiz are. So all right, we've set it up decently well. The, in fact, I'm going to cheat here. Not really cheat. I'm going to try to use, there we go. So there's this professor emeritus, which means with all respect, he's old, uh, who is in Florida and created the MAAW. There it is, MAAW.info. And um, that was kind of an inspiration to me for, for the idea of creating my own textbook. He'd create a lot of wrote a lot of things, and created some nice diagrams. So I like his diagram here. It kind of sets up the different questions you're asking about how to accumulate costs, how to account for costs, excuse me, how to account for costs. And that, that the way you answer those different questions determines the costing system you, you adopt. So you have the input measurement basis. Do we just do actuals, which is pure historical? Do we do normal historical? Meaning, do we do historical for direct labor and direct materials, but then we, we do some sort of normalized PDOH rate? Uh, for, if I'm remembering right, um, for overhead, or to be full standard, where if you remember for full standard, WIP is at full standard. Like, all, direct materials, direct labor, and overhead are all recorded at what their standard costs are. So what is our input measurement? Is it at what it was actually cost? Is it somewhat at what, we actually, what it actually cost? Or is it at some standard we've set at that, that level of measurement? The way we value it in, what do we, um, inventory evaluation method. What do we consider an inventoryable or product cost? Throughput accounting, we'll talk about that in a minute, and direct accounting, or also called variable costing, direct costing or variable costing, excuse me. Those two right there are what we're going to cover primarily in our backflush section of chapter eight. Full absorption is what we talked about throughout chapter four, and it's chapter six is also using full absorption. We absorb all overhead costs into our inventory accounts. The, you know, all, all direct materials, direct labor, and overhead is considered product cost, right? And it's debited to WIP eventually. And activity-based is where we say, well, let's rejigger all our overhead definitions so that we can we can figure out uh, what's actually being driven using multiple cost drivers. So different Swiss cheese definition of overhead, but still we treat that as inventoryable um, just with a different definition of overhead. Cost accumulation method, at what level do we accumulate the cost? Do we accumulate it at the job or order? So job order costing uses this. We're going to allocate overhead based on cost level at the job or order. We're measuring cost drivers per order or per job. Process, we stop 
stop subdividing costs at the process level. We're just worried about department level rates and then costs. So that's why we did all the calculations to get our costs from the, the upper the upper left part of the, the T account down to the what went what got credited out of the T account and the ending whip. Just that's at the, the process level because this T account represents one process. Back flush was what we're going to talk about. And hybrid, we don't talk about that, but there's some good cases out there that maybe someday, if you continue with the master's, somebody will, will cover for you with you, um, where you can you can merge some of these. You can do your direct materials on a process level, but your direct labor on a on a job or order level. You can you can hybridize some of these where you accumulate costs. Your cost flow assumption, specific identification, FIFO, weighted average, those are our, our primary ones. Uh, in in terms of internal reporting, what we find useful for internal reporting, LIFO is not on there uh, for, for whatever reason. I'm not not LIFO is generally a fin considered by by a lot of managerial accountants to be a, a financial accounting construction to to play with the numbers. That's 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 probably why it's not on there. I didn't build this though, so write to Professor Martin, I believe, who wrote this. Anyway, what do we what do we uh, consider to be the flow? How we are assuming the, the flow to be of costs? First one in, first one out, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, not very important for what we're talking about this chapter. And lastly, this is important. You might not think you're like, well, obviously everything's going to be perpetual now. Every accounting system can be updated almost instantaneously. So as soon as you push the button and the general ledger, uh, the, the journal entry is recorded. General ledger, is going to, general ledger is going to update, and your inventory counts are going to be updated in perpetual fashion. What interval do we record? Actually, this is the chapter where we don't do that. Backflush almost always uses a periodic system. Even if it's a modern accounting information system, Backflush prefers a periodic system because we don't want to, um, because it's not worth it tracking day-to-day -day inventory levels because the whole idea is to keep them very, very low. They should be a rounding error. The inventory level is, is the lean practitioner's point. All right, so what we're doing is we're going to be focusing on a pure historical throughput or direct back flush periodic system. And I believe it, it fits under weighted average. We're not going to focus in on that, and definitely no, 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 different, no differentiation between cost flow here. So the basic idea of backflush is now that depending on it sounds kind of gross. Okay, I get it. Sounds like backwash, or sounds like a toilet flushing. Uh, but the the basic idea is is to kind of visualize what the costs are doing. Where uh, where did it fit under where the costs are accumulated, right? Or um, yeah where the costs are accumulated. And you're like, well, why, what, what is the, how, where is the being, how does it get accumulated at, at the back flush? Well, the point is, is that you have the traditional process. This is like direct materials or raw materials account, going to whip, going to finished goods, going to cost of goods sold. <clears throat> the whole punchline is, Every cost that we consider inventoriable or product cost is going to be accumulated at the very end of the process and cost of goods sold. And only at the end of the period, for the very few units we still have, because we're using just in time or lean production, we're going to backflush to fill in these accounts from cost of goods sold. Since we expect most of it to flow through and just go to cost of goods sold anyway, we're just going to put the cost there in the first place. And at the end of the period, you know, just to adjust it and, and, and account for the very few units that are in these, these categories, we'll backflush. We'll have an a backflush entry where we end up crediting costs of goods sold and debit our inventory accounts. Be that one, two, three, or one, two, or, or one even in certain circumstances. So that's the basic shape of it. This is the backflush, this arrow, or this entry. And hopefully that shows why it's called that. You, you end up accumulating costs at the end of the, the flow through the balance sheet, and you only back flush a very small number of the costs at the end of, of the period. Or after the end of the period. <clears throat> so it can technically be paired with any inventory valuation rationale. So it can be paired with any of these. 
But if you're, if you're really going to get the benefits of backflush, of this, this, this way of accumulating costs at the end and backflushing when the period ends, when the period is over, <clears throat> backflushing at the end of the, the, the flow of costs you know, on the income statement and backflushing to inventory state accounts on the balance sheet at the end of the period there, and that's the, the sense I want to say. If you're going to get the benefits of that, you're probably going to also change how you do your what you value as inventory, what you consider to be inventory. <clears throat> now let me go down to one, the direct costing example right here. So the thing is with full absorption costing, there is a significant incentive to overproduce. And maybe you've seen this already, but here's an illustration of it just to remind you. The idea is <clears throat> this is what really economically I should be doing. Let's say I'm the, what do I, what do I say? I'm the manager, I'm the factory manager, I'm the manager here, okay? <clears throat> and I know that really there's only demand for me to sell a thousand units. And so I produce a thousand units. If I'm an honest, upstanding person, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I get an operating income of 22,000 based on all these factors right here. And this is overhead control. Our actual overhead incurred was equal to the amount applied. No closing entry required. Remember from chapter four, closing out overhead control and everything. So absorption costing gives us a $22,000 operating income. Direct costing, let me just, I'll put it in the sheet here so you have a record of it if you want. With direct costing, here, I'll do full absorption. We consider direct labor, direct material, well, usually direct materials, direct materials, direct labor, uh, variable overhead and fixed overhead, all three product costs. And then we consider period costs to be um, the SGNA costs, selling general and administrative costs. All right, under direct or also called variable costing, we consider direct materials, direct labor, and variable overhead to be product costs. Uh, yeah, that we're going to put into our inventory accounts. And we're going to leave as period costs our selling general administrative and our fixed overhead. Because we, well, it should be fixed. Why are we allocating it based on a cost driver? So we're gonna just consider it a fixed cost, like a period cost that we incur, despite the fact that it's overhead and related to production. No, 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 let's, let's leave that off. And why is because of this. Now, if I'm a manager who's gonna respect the actual demand, I will, under absorption costing and direct costing get the same operating income number. So what direct costing has done is it's taken out the variable cost of goods sold, direct materials, direct labor, and variable overhead, and uh, subtract that away from our sales above contribution margin. So notice it's, it's following the contribution margin income statement. And taking the fixed costs or fixed overhead beneath here. And it would be, SG&A would be in there, in there as well, but since SG&A doesn't differ, it's always considered product cost under direct absorption. I haven't included it in the, the spreadsheet. So I'm subtracting away fixed overhead right here. And so I end up with the same amount, 22,000, 22,000, 18,000 and 20,000 20, here versus just subtracting them all, 38,000 right here. Okay, okay. Now let's say I'm, you know, 22,000 is great, but it's not enough for me to get my bonus, all right? And I really need my yacht, okay? I don't know if you've tried to go sailing without a yacht, but, you know, that's not for me. So I want my yacht. I can, I can just overproduce by 250. And I will increase my income of my, of my branch. Boom. Under absorption costing, I overproduced by 250 and it increases my income by $4,000 or $4 million if we're, you know, knocking off zeros here. Why? Because a significant portion of the total fixed overhead lands on the balance sheet. Okay. Debits and expenses are both, excuse me, inventory accounts, assets, and expenses are both debits. And that debit is going to go through this snake on the balance sheet before it hits the income statement. And by overproducing, I've built a, a, a lump in the snake on the balance sheet of debits that haven't hit the, the income statement. So I've disproportionately, I, I've, I've rebalanced fixed overhead because I overproduced. So much more of fixed overhead is over here because it's fixed. It's going to be a certain amount. It's $20,000. Because now I have 1250 units and 250 of them are stuck on the balance sheet, 
well, a proportion of that 20,000 is stuck on the balance sheet too. It doesn't hit the income statement. Therefore, it doesn't affect my operating income. It's not there anymore. I don't have 38,000 right here because $4,000 worth of my fixed overhead right there got credited to COGS when I, when I was closing out the entry here <clears throat> and it reduced my costs. Now, let's say that's not quite enough for the yacht I want and deserve. Of course, you know me. I, I deserve a better yacht than just the $4,000. <laughs> yeah, come on. So I can overproduce by a lot. The incentive just keeps going. I'll say I double demand. Demand is only a 1,000 units. People don't want this that much, whatever I'm producing. But I could, in the short term at least, really overproduce. Double the demand. I know there's no need for it. It's going to be stuck in a warehouse, probably get obsolete, and we'll have to write it off later. But I'll deal about that later. I'll be, I'll be at sea when that happens. Oh, who cares? Now I can double my production here. And look, I have, I have added $10,000 from my original income. It, was, it used to be $22,000 under absorption costing, rose to $26,000. And now with double production, double the production that's required, overproducing double, uh, I've, I've increased it to $32,000. Because I pushed $10,000 of our $20,000 fixed overhead onto the balance sheet. Because that $20,000 is going to be divided evenly among all the units produced, and half of them are stuck on the balance sheet. Those debits for the fixed overhead costs are in finished goods or work in process or somewhere over there. And they're not hitting the income statement anymore. So that's $10,000 of debits not on the income statement, which means $10,000 more of income at the end of the calculation. <clears throat> now I can go on my yacht. Good. What you know, may have noticed is that these calculations here have to stay the same. We, we, have, we have, with direct costing, kept all that fiction out of it because we're always going to be subtracting away the full 20000 of fixed overhead because we consider it a period cost. It's going to be subtracted away in the period that it's incurred with no funny business about some of it flowing into the long snake of debits through the balance sheet. Well, no, it, just, it goes directly to the income statement. Directly right here. And so it's been 22,000, 22,000, 22,000. So direct costing removes the incentive to overproduce. This is why a firm with a lean mentality who wants to minimize inventory is going to want to use direct costing. And so a backflow system that uses direct costing, which remember, it's changing the, def the definition of what's a product cost by moving this fixed overhead over here. See? It's over there now. So I will highlight them to show the difference there. All green. So we are, we're changing the definition of what's a product or an inventoriable cost. What gets debited into work and process, basically, is the idea uh, when we incur the cost. <clears throat> and under direct costing, we don't have fixed overhead because we want to reduce or remove. We want to remove the incentive to overproduce. Therefore, we're going to have less inventory laying around because managers wanted their yachts, so they overproduced beyond what they knew was actual demand. Okay, uh, now to jump over capacity variances for a second, and to summarize in a way that is um, a, a crime, the theory of constraints, the basic idea is if you go down the rabbit hole of what's really holding the company back, the ultimate constraint of all companies is time. And so we have to marry our overall process or meter it to the time uh, that we have in a day. Because every company has 24 hours in a day, great. So we're going to focus in on our bottlenecks, and eventually the logic of that leads to, again, I'm, I'm going to have to summarize it in a way that just doesn't make much sense. Just take my word for it, I guess. Uh, you can investigate it on your own, or if you know it already, great, you can fill in the gaps here. Eventually that leads to the idea that the only truly variable cost is raw materials. So under throughput accounting, we're going to do the same process, but we're going to be even more extreme about it. Uh, I want more. One more row. Throughput accounting. Uh, we are going to say, you know what? Actually, the only truly variable cost is... Direct materials. Raw materials, direct materials. So that's the only product cost. That's the only thing we're going we're to be debiting to work in process and finished goods. 
because direct labor and variable overhead and fixed overhead, uh, they're not, they're not variable enough or their variability is not tied enough to our true, the true, uh, ability of us to push units and sales through our time constraint or throughput to put onto the value of these units in process. And also, this also works out, this, this, what I have highlighted right here, it also is truer in most circumstances. Very, very, very few people are paid piece rate. Uh, back in the day of the Henry Ford, you'd be paid per wheel you put on. That's piece rate. Now, at best, people are paid per hour. That's, that's as, about as, as low as, uh, uh, low a, uh, refinement as, as you get in, in most, most manufacturing companies. Your frontline workers will be paid by the hour, uh, at, at, at minimum. And many of them will still be salaried, actually, or the, uh, they'll have union contracts or other, other contracts, uh, based on market forces, the not unions, that effectively guarantee a minimum wage, a minimum amount of work that their accredited is having done. So how variable really is direct labor cost in the modern age? It's not terribly variable. So there's, there's a decent rationale for this critique. Bottom line is, when we get to lean accounting questions, uh, this is the only product cost, direct materials or raw materials. That's the punchline of it. All right, now, I, I, I really jumped through, and I, I, we, we aren't going to need, I don't think we have any of these uh, questions I don't think we have any of these questions in the, the quiz. So don't worry about 8.4.2.3. Paragraph B, subsection alpha. And let's go over our capacity constraints real quick. I, should I? You know, actually, I want to I talk about direct and throughput before we go over the capacity variances. Capacity constraints, is that what they're called? Capacity variances. So let's go over this first. So I, I breezed over... Another change that happens. So this is the traditional way of, of dividing up your costs. And you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and copy that over into the, the spreadsheet again so we have a, a record of it. So typically we have uh, direct materials or raw materials accounts. And that flows to work in process. And that flows to finished, finished goods. And that flows to cost of goods sold. Now, in, in a lot of lean firms, or a good number of lean firms, they want to pull out different categories of cost in a way that's kind of reminiscent to process costing, because it helps them manage in the, the leanness of their, their firm better. And so what they have instead is a RIP account and a conversion cost account that together lead to finished goods, which leads to cost of goods sold. Now the RIP account stands for uh, raw and in process. The er, the i, and the p, raw and in process. So the raw materials, any materials in process. So we're, we're splitting WIP up into two, and any direct materials that are in WIP, we're mashing back over into direct materials to make the RIP account. Raw and in process. And then what's left over is the direct labor and overhead we consumed on work in process. And so those are conversion costs. So we can think of this as our direct materials, uh, like we did in process costing. And over here, our CC, our conversion costs, should be ringing some bells, hopefully happy bells. You know, bells of the soldiers returning from war, they're happy, yay, right? Not sad bells of, of uh, sad events. Um, and anyway, those are our, our costs that we're typically crediting to. So over here, this is our, our uh, back flush entry under a, an example direct, uh, direct costing situation here. Crediting cost of goods sold because we committed all dur during the period. So here we go. Let me, let me go the whole, the whole way. During the period, we incurred $50,000 direct, of direct materials cost right here in this example. We're going to debit it directly to cost of goods sold. We have an accounts payable, $50,000 because we owe the supplier $50,000. Uh, and we're going to take the actual cost and debit, debit it directly to cost of goods sold. We use some labor. We owe the laborers $91,000, and we're going to debit that directly to cost of goods sold. We have machine maintenance. Well, that saves some machine workers and some materials for them to help with maintenance, to repair things or replace things. 
uh, 11,000 and 4,000 credits to these two payables and debit the cost directly to costs of goods sold. And then at the end, we're assuming all of these are variable overhead costs uh, here. And then at the end of the period, we do our count of, hey, oh, we had this number of units in, in process or raw and in process. And we had this number of units in, uh, well, of those units, we had this amount of cost that was related to conversion costs and this number of units in, in finished goods. <clears throat> and so we're going to credit 1200 to cost of goods sold to back flush that cost into the inventory accounts. And what that looks like, number four, here, I just summarized it, just like I did up here. Down here, I make it more explicit because I explain the idea of, of RIP and conversion costs. So we're going to debit, in this example, debiting 400 for RIP. Maybe $200 of that is, at the end of the day, we, we looked in the warehouse and we have $200 of raw materials we didn't use. Okay, that's the raw portion of WIP. And we also have um, $200 worth of materials we used in process. So that's $400 total debited to RIP. And then we have $250 worth of direct labor and overhead cost, variable overhead costs that we incurred that on, on units in process. So that's $250 there. And our finished goods, we have, let's say, I don't know, let's say the cost of them is $10 per, and we have 55 of them we counted in finished goods. We accept that's $550 to finished goods. Okay, so that's a total, our total um, uh, journal entry right there. And under throughput accounting, because we only consider the inventoryable cost to be raw materials, that number four here looks different. There's only RIP, because that's the raw and process materials, and finished goods, which is also still only valued at the direct materials amount of those finished goods. So almost always, if we're comparing side by side a throughput accounting versus a direct costing, or always it should be, the, the throughput accounting will be back flushing lower amounts than the direct costing. And if you want to use that rule of thumb and say, oh, well, there are two numbers. I've, I've narrowed it down on this question to two different numbers. One of them's higher, one of them's lower. And I just want to guess because I don't know. I got a, an appointment or something. Maybe I'm trying to trick you and give me the, the, the higher number is direct costing and the lower number is throughput accounting. It's very possible that I've formulated the question that way. You're free to increase your odds using that piece of knowledge. All right, so let's look at um, the last piece before we do any questions. So capacity cost variances. <clears throat> capacity cost variances. No. Capacity variances. There we go. So they don't want to do the normal form of variance analysis we said in Chapter 7. Instead, <clears throat> what we want to do is we want to figure out how we're varying in terms of actual things that we want to manage. Remember, we were trying to manage our costs to reduce all of them, basically, with standard costing. That is the incentive structure in a standard costing system, is to reduce all costs. Costs driven by higher prices, costs driven by inefficient usage of direct materials or direct labor or overhead. That's always the, the drive. Here, no. Under lean, pra lean practice, the idea is us having idle capacity where we have workers or materials or a factory that's not being used and it could be used to produce value for customers, that is the waste we want to attack. It's time-related waste here. I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to fit that into the, the structure of, of the overall philosophy. Again, I'm kind of breezing through the, the ideas here. <clears throat> the point is, is that they are going to measure variances, but their variance is based on idle capacity. So at the, at the, two, at the two bookends here, we have theoretical capacity and actual capacity. So let's go through the examples here because I actually worked out the numbers. When I do it, when I try and do it in my head and on the on the fly, I, I always end up dividing weirdly because uh, the example uses some weird numbers, like 1.5 for how many hours a class is. So theoretical capacity is the maximum theoretically possible work that a machine, team, or process can perform. So this is always derived with pen and paper. Oh, there are 24 hours in a day. This machine can spit out five units an hour. 5 times 24 is the theoretical capacity of that machine. Basically, with, with no extra caveats of, well, I don't even care. I don't even want it to take a break. All right, how many of you have seen the greatest cinematic, cinematic masterpiece of the last 20 years? Cars. Yeah, you, you, know, you know a, a, a dumb movie was coming. I'm, sorry, I'm, a wonderful movie was coming. All right, how does Cars start? What is like the opening set of scenes there? Where is Lightning McQueen at? 
He's losers for breakfast. All right, he's getting ready for the big race. He's eating losers for breakfast. All right. And then he gets called out. He goes and he races. All right. How does this race end? A three-way tie. A three-way tie. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. yeah we, got some, we got some fans here. Good, good cinema. That's awesome. Yes. Okay. Why, why does he? He was like way ahead, wasn't he? Yeah. Yes. Okay. He was saying, well, I am a fast car. And fast cars can go around the track very fast. That's my theoretical capacity. He stopped the calculation right there. I don't need no tires. Forget that. I'm a fast car. I can go 300 miles an hour. This lap is a quarter mile. So I can go, you know, do the math. He did the math or whatever. Maybe he didn't. Just kind of spitballed it. But <clears throat> that's the basic idea. Theoretical capacity is Lightning McQueen saying, well, I, who needs maintenance? I don't care. What is the maximum speed I can go? <clears throat> Anyway, so the example here, which is a dumb example, but I think it brings it home a little bit. So there are 24 hours in a day. You are a student producing a degree. Uh, and if each class meets for one and a half hours a day, your theor theoretical capacity is 16 courses per semester. That's not 16 three credit hour courses. That's 16 courses that meet every day of the week. Those are at least eight, hour cre eight credit hour courses. So how many of you are enrolled in 16 eight credit hour courses right now? Lazy, lazy people. How dare you? I'm offended. All right, yeah. Theoretical capacity is almost always unreachable. Yeah. Of course, if somebody raises their hand at that point, we have, we have found ChatGPT, and, and he or she has outed himself, okay? So we have, we have found the, the robot among us if somebody raised their hand at that. <clears throat> yeah, no, 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 no. Theoretical capacity is the bar bookend of like, this is, this is, we're never going to reach this. The idea is not really to reach that. The idea is to, 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 to find ways to, over time, shrink the gaps between these five definitions of capacity. The capacity is at the top. It's at the, the, the I put it over here, book in, but at the top, whatever. The, the most theoretical, the most capacity that a machine, process, or team could, could perform, or person. All right. Uh, let's, we'll just go down the path. And the other end is, is actual, but we'll go down the path to get there. Then, then OK, OK. Now, let's say Lightning McQueen learns his lesson, and he's like, oh, I actually do need tires? OK, OK. So yeah, I need some maintenance. So practical capacity, now, we're still on pen and paper. It's still in a theoretical world. The first two are theoretical. The bottom three are empirical, or based on what actually happens in life. Top two are just somebody could come up with these numbers just with pen and paper and a few facts about the, the machinery, or the person, or the, the team, or whatever. And I don't know why I use a different list for theoretical and practical capacity. Let's see. It's not like a team is only available for theoretical capacity and not for practice. It should be the same list. Uh, I don't know why. Machine, team, process, and person. And it should be machine, team, process, and person here. So point is, it's a different definition, not, not who is doing it. <clears throat> but that's the work that you can do in a given period of time, assuming reasonable, reasonably necessary rest and maintenance. OK, yeah, I have to stop for tires. Or yeah, I'll break, I'll, my tires will blow, and I'll get a three-way tie, and I'll have like a crazy movie. And you know, that'll, that'll be the end of my, my, my crazy, crazy life. All right, um, so the difference between these two, the difference between theoretical capacity and practical capacity tells us about what kind of maintenance is required for the machinery, or the team, or the people. And we get our first capacity variance, rate-based waste. And they call them all waste, OK? Don't be offended. They're just saying, this is a possible target where we could shrink it. If we have a machine that requires eight hours maintenance, and we upgrade it to a machine that only requires six hours of maintenance and rest or downtime or whatever, we have reduced our rate-based waste by upgrading that machine. We have now increased by two hours a day how long that machine can be operational. At least we've shrunk that gap between theoretical and practical capacity. All right, so continuing the example, uh, let's see. Yeah, you you have you have um, you have to sleep. I'm assuming, right? Again, maybe there are some robots among us. I don't think so. I haven't haven't really gotten any any vibes like that. But if there are, um, you can't really get 16 courses a semester. That's courses I meet every single day. So eight credit hour courses, 16 times eight. You know, you're basically getting a degree in a, a semester or two. You're not doing that. You have to rest. So if we took 16 hours a day, because that's 24 minus eight, and now oh, we got a lovely thing right here. We have 16 hours a day, and we have 1.5 hours per, per class. We could divide that and say, you should be completing about, about 11 courses 
out of time. You should be enrolled in 11, 80, or 8 credit hour courses. How many of us are there? Yeah. All right. All right. Not, as, not, as, not as much punch the second time I make the joke, but, you know. Still, practical capacity is still out of reach. It almost, it's, it's not, it's still theoretical. But it's a little less theoretical because we've, we've taken into account some reasonable rest and maintenance required. So why, why, well, let's talk about that for a second. Why wouldn't you take 11 courses of eight credit hours a piece? Why wouldn't you go to sleep, wake up, go to class, to go to sleep again? And really, why wouldn't you? you I, I'm sure you have answers for it. None of you are doing it. You, you eat? Yes, okay, you have to eat? Okay, so maybe eight hours of sleep is not all we need. We eat? Life outside of class? Yeah, you mean it's useful to, to do other things besides study all the time? Oh, man. Okay. What else do you do? Uh, yeah, yeah, you're attending these classes. That's great. But when are you doing the work for them? In your sleep? I, I guess, I guess you, if you're that efficient at studying in your sleep somehow, you could do that, maybe, and have no life outside. Yes. Yeah, there's no time to do the actual work. Okay. Right, but let's say like something like for a three credit hour class, you're supposed to spend twice that number of credit hours outside of class working on it or whatever. I think that's the, the, the rule of thumb a lot of people use. <clears throat> yeah, so okay, so good reasons. Also, uh, a number of us are, you know, you might want to work. You want to get some, some time in with, I mean, you talk about other things outside, not just socializing, which is important, not just family or community responsibilities, but you, you know, you might be working, uh, you might have hobbies. That's still allowed, despite being a student. You're still allowed to do that, that kind of thing. So yeah, okay, this, this is still outside of reach. Okay, so now we get down to the next. There's this big gap between practical capacity, which is all theoretical, and normal capacity. So normal capacity is not, I have taken a pen and paper, and I've said, paper, and I've said, well, here's 16 hours a day, waking hours, and 1.5 hours per class, and therefore 10.67 classes per day. You should have that. Uh, instead, I've said, okay, well, let me go survey a thousand students and see what they usually do. Let me go survey a thousand machines or days at this machine. What does it usually do? The normal capacity for this machine, this worker, this team, this person. So usually over a long term, let's figure out what empirically is normal for this. And what, what, if you had to guess, just to go with our, our credit hour example, what's, what's typical credit hours for a full time student? 12, 15, something around there. I heard both those. I think I, I usually hear that every semester. That sounds like about normal capacity for a student. And that seems to be about a full-time student on average with all the other things pulling at them, including time outside to do the actual coursework of those classes and other normal levels of socializing and, and maintaining like, you know, eating or exercising. Uh, and work if they have it, that's, that's about where we get. And that's, that's, that sounds like that's about normal capacity. So we have 88 credit hours, which is the 11 classes that are 8 credit hours each, down to 12 to 15 credit hours. Let's say 12. Let's pick a number. So we got a big gap there between theoretical land, practical capacity, and normal capacity. And the name for that variance is management policy waste. Waste, quote unquote. They're all called waste. Don't, again, don't take it personally. That's practical capacity minus normal capacity. <clears throat> So the idea here is, is that, well, sometimes management policy could, could push that normal closer to the practical amount. So for example, with the credit hours, because that's, that's we're, on, we're in it, we're on a roll, uh, management, meaning the university, could create some policies like, I don't know, reducing the cost of summer classes. And then if they did that, then theoretically you'd have more classes on average per year as the norm. More people would enroll in summer classes as in addition to full-time fall and spring or part-time fall and spring or whatever. That would probably increase the normal number of credit hours people are carrying per, per term over time. So that's, that's, that's why it has this name. But the point is, is this, this definition. So with these questions, the strategy for these questions on the final is to build some sort of a diagram that looks, looks something like this. So. Theoretical, practical, normal, no, budgeted, and then actual. And then this is uh, 
rate-based waste is the difference between these two. You're kind of building a, a, you know, the mountain peak thing we did, but on its side, the lean has to be different. And here's management policy waste. And on, this is on like your note, your notes. You're going to take the exam. You have a sheet of paper you can do. Um, you can easily write in, this is theoretical minus practical. Oh, sorry, that is it. My point is, is that you could keep going with this and you need to define theoretical is, is a, a maximum without any rest, maximum capacity without any rest, uh, practical and, and so on and so forth. You keep defining these down and, and this is, this would be an easy thing to bring to a, uh, the, the exam to help you sort out these kinds of questions. All right, real quick through, uh, budgeted way, uh, no, 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 sorry, budgeted capacity. So we have normal is 12, let's say, let's say credit hours. Budget capacity is the work expected to be done this period. So let's say you're a single student, you're, you're personal, you're, you're one, this is now we're down to one student. The normal for all students is like 12. Maybe even for you, it's like 12. But this particular semester coming up, uh, you, you have an internship and it's very important to your career, for example. So you're going to bring it down to nine or six. So you're budgeting a lower capacity and it's for a particular reason, but you are creating a gap between normal capacity and budget capacity. So that is called budgeted waste in lean practitioner. So normal capacity, less budgeted capacity. And if the waste is for a good enough reason, they're not gonna shake a, a finger at it. <clears throat> and then you budgeted nine credit hours, but that, you know, that cost accounting class was just too hard, so you dropped it, so you only had six. Your actual capacity of work done that period was six credit hours. And so that's the difference between budgeted and actual capacity. And then that produces another waste, which is efficiency waste. All right, so those problems are, are once you have yourself a, a, a write-up of the five bullet points above with the four bullet points below, you know, you got five bullet points, five parent bullet points, one, two, three, four, five, and then in between them go one, two, three, four, five, four, four, excuse me, four types of waste, one, two, three, four. Uh, you, you can, you can get that settled in, in those questions pretty well. I want to do, I want to do a backflush question though before we, we close. So it's just, to, just to show you the general architecture so we can get, we can hit the ground running on Wednesday with these kinds of questions. All right. So here we go. Um, here's a kind of question. So we have, uh, this is asking for the cost backflushed to the RIP account. And it tells you what the accounts it uses. It uses RIP conversion costs and finished goods. So this is an inventory account, this is an inventory account, this is an inventory account. What three inventory accounts do you use? RIP, conversion costs, and finished goods. And we have some data up here that we're gonna use. And so, and we also in bold here are using direct costing in this particular question. Well, I have a bunch of caveats here just to help you make, to tell you basically this is a simple question. Don't overthink this question. All actual amounts are equal to budgeted amounts and the firm has no fixed overhead. So don't worry about any of that. <clears throat> now the, Cost back flush to RIP. What does RIP stand for? Raw and in process. And you can put in parentheses if you want, raw and in process materials. We're talking about materials that are raw and materials in process. <clears throat> and so we're really just worried about getting a per unit direct materials cost number and figuring out if we have any raw materials by physical count at the end. So what we need to do, this is our RIP debit question. We know we have 500,000. Let me get these arranged here. I promise, really, I know we're close on time, but we're, we'll be able to get it, I promise. So that's our direct materials cost. And I put in these helpful things here. That's excluding any unused raw materials. Uh, that, that I, I, every question should have this if it, if it is using, just to simplify things. Uh, uh, on Wednesday, I can tell you the reason why. In the previous semester, they didn't, and I had to get this big long spiel about why Lean wouldn't care or whatever. I just I just made the questions easier, uh, more, more, more straightforward by including these, these, this caveat right here. All right, and so that's our direct materials cost, and our total units completed in process is two thousand. So we are literally just going to divide, and that's our DM cost per unit. No worrying about equivalent units. Some of them parts it. I don't care. I don't care if they're partially done. They get a full dose of direct materials cost here. 250. So we have 350 
done in, in finished goods. We have 250 in process. Oh, what does RIP stand for? What does the IP stand for in process? So these 250 units get each $250. Just happens to be the same number. And this is our IP portion of debit to RIP. And look, it's tempting us. It's there. It's like, oh, come eat me. No, no, bad cake. Over here, remember, right, this bowl right here is that the firm does a count of raw materials and finds 31,250 raw materials. That's the ur, the raw portion of raw and in process. So 31,250 uh, raw materials, and we sum them. So the two together, the raw portion, ur portion of rip, of debit to rip, this is, this is going to be the answer we want. All right, so the questions are going to take structure kind of like this. We'll talk more about it Wednesday and go over capacity variance questions. Again, once we get the definitions, you, you, you're going to have it golden. All right, thank you very much.